Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar. Uh, we're uh, very lucky to be joined by Elisa Quintana today. Uh, she's come over to us from NASA Ames, where she works at uh, the Kepler Data Center. Uh, Elisa did her uh, BS in Physics at the University of California, San Diego, and then uh, moved to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor to do a Master's in Physics and uh, Space uh, Studies, and also her PhD. Uh, she moved back to NASA Ames uh, to work with Jack Lissau on simulations of binary stars, in particular uh, Alpha Centauri, as part of her PhD work. And then in 2006, she joined uh, SETI after uh, doing a, a, a NASA postdoc at uh, NASA Ames. And since then, she spent uh, five years as a scientific programmer on the Kepler mission, uh, during which time she developed a technique of uh, confirming exoplanets using only Kepler photometry. And uh, she uh, is now a senior NPP fellow as of uh, uh, April this year. And uh, for those of you who are SETI Talks aficionados, you'll know that uh, Elisa actually gave the 12th seminar of uh, this series back in two th February 2008. And uh, most recently, uh, Elisa was uh, the lead author on uh, the discovery paper uh, in science of Kepler-186f, which is, uh, as she's going to tell us, an, an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of a cool star. So please join me in welcoming Elisa. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, so my name is Elisa Quintana. Um, as uh, Adrian said, I'm uh, now at Ames uh, as a NASA senior fellow working with Bill Brookie. Um, so I actually came to Ames in 1999 to work with Bill Brookie on the Vulcan camera project, and I've come full circle, and, and now I'm doing some more uh, postdoc work with them. Uh, so um, today I'd like to talk about Earth-sized planets around M stars. Um, so for the first half of my talk, um, I'd like to talk about M stars and why they're interesting targets to look for uh, Earth-sized habitable planets. Um, and then I'd like to talk about the Kepler-186 system, which we announced earlier this year. Um, for the second half of my talk, I'd like to focus on how these planets form um, and discuss their potential for uh, creating water, retaining water. So. We, we could turn up the volume just a little bit. Okay, I'll try to talk louder. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the um, NASA's Kepler mission. Uh, one of the primary goals of the mission is to determine the frequency of Earth-sized planets and the habitable zones of other stars. Um, so for the primary mission of four years, this spacecraft uh, uh, followed, um, looked at the same patch of sky and monitored the brightness of over 150,000 stars. And so the instrument detects planets by collecting light from each star about every 30 minutes. Um, when, a when a planet crosses in front of its star, blocks some of the starlight, um, the decrease in light um, from these transit is, is proportional to the size of the planet relative to the size of the star. So because we only measure the proportion of light that's blocked, uh, we have to know the size of the star very well in order to uh, determine the size of the planet. Okay, so uh, here's a sample of realistic data um, where you can see the dips in the light curve from a transiting planet um, pretty clearly. Um, in between the two transits, you can see um, variations in starlight from stellar variability and noise. Um, and so the uh, shape and the depth of each of these transits gives you information on the planet size. And you can extract the orbital period very precisely um, by looking at the timing between uh, two transits, between two dips. Um, so now I'd like to introduce M stars and explain why it's easier to detect Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of these M stars. And so the, uh, I should explain, the habitable zone is the region around a star uh, within which liquid water um, can uh, be sustained given a planet has an appropriate atmosphere, like Earth's. Um, so on the Left, we show an Earth-sized planet transiting the Sun. On the right, we show an Earth-sized planet transiting Kepler-186. So Kepler-186 is an M star. Um, M stars 
Uh, they're also known as uh, red dwarfs or M dwarfs. They're stars that are smaller and cooler than the sun, um, and so they're therefore dimmer. Um, they range in size from 10% to 50% of the size of our sun. Um, Kepler-186 is on the larger size, so it's about half the size and half the mass of our sun. And so uh, we know that the Earth is habitable at 1 AU from the, from the sun. Um, for M dwarfs and Kepler-186, the habitable zone is located much closer in because you need to be closer to feel that, that warmth. And so for the case of Kepler-186, the habitable zone is between about 0.2 and 0.4 AU from, from the star. So the plots on the bottom show the dips in the light curve that Kepler would see um, as this Earth, Earth planet um, crosses each of these stars. And because M stars are smaller, um, an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of an M star is going to block a greater proportion of light uh, compared to an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of a Sun-like star. And so uh, this leads to deeper transits, um, which are easier to detect. And also because these planets orbit very close to their stars, uh, they orbit more frequently, and so we see more transits. Um, so, uh, for example, in a given time span, say four, in a four-year mission, we might see four transits of uh, Earth orbiting a Sun-like star, um, whereas for Kepler-186, we can see three times as many transits um, because the planet's in a 130-day orbital period. Um, so the combination of deeper transits and more frequent transits um, you get a larger signal-to-noise ratio, and this is why it's um, much easier to detect these smaller planets around M dwarfs. Oh, I forget my thought. So, oh, Caesar. So um, let's take a look at some real data. Um, on this slide, uh, we show uh, four different planets orbiting a sun-like star. So in the upper left, you see Jupiter. In the upper right, we see Neptune. Um, these, these planets show a clear detectable signal. Um, in the lower left, you see a two Earth-sized planet, um, which you can still see. When you have a one Earth-sized planet orbiting the sun, as you see in the lower right, um, you can see it's much more difficult to pull out these signals. Um, and that's because we have fewer transits and, um, and the signals are just small, so it's, so it's very difficult. We're constantly trying to improve our algorithms to, to pull out these small signals. So if you take these same four planets and place them around a M not star like Kepler-186, um, but you move them in so they are in the habitable zone where they receive the same uh, amount of starlight that the Earth receives from the sun, um, you can see that the signals are much deeper and much easier to detect. Um, even the one Earth-sized planet in the lower right around this M star, um, you can kind of see by eye. And so this is why M stars are, are great targets when we're searching for other Earths. And this is why um, we found Kepler-186f. Um, Kepler-186f is an M dwarf. Um, the, so it's not surprising that the first Earth-sized planet found in the habitable zone of another star was found around an M star. And um, this is an artist's concept, of course, of what the planet might look like um, if it had a Earth-like atmosphere. And so uh, this planet, Kepler-186f, is the outermost of five planets around this M dwarf. So the plot on the left shows the folded light curve for all of the planets, um, with Kepler-186f in the, in the lower panel. Um, the inner four planets are, are orbit very close in. Um, they're all smaller than about 1.4 Earth radii, so they're all small planets. Um, they orbit with between 4 and 22 days of the star. Um, Kepler-186f orbits um, much further, relatively further, at 130 days. And it's um, 10 within 10% the size of Earth. And so the inner four planets were actually confirmed um, early on in the mission by Jason Rowe um, when he did his batch of hundreds of multi-planet systems. Um, and that was using the first two years of data. And it, wasn't, uh, it took an additional year of data to, to be able to see this, um, this signal um, in the SOC pipeline. So um, 
Uh, once we saw the signal, um, it took our team about an additional year to get the ground-based measurements. Um, we got uh, adapti adaptive optics from Keck and some other ground-based images from Gemini. Mm -hmm. And, with, and then we were able to confirm the planet, um, characterizing it. And so it took a full year to go from uh, discover, uh, detecting the planet to actually confirming it and publishing it. So these, these guys take a while to confirm. OK, so let's look at the system a little closer. Um, the Kepler-186 system is at about uh, 500 light years away. So it's pretty far. Um, this is a top-down view of the uh, five-planet system. Uh, the star is at the center of the illustration. The white circular streaks show the orbits of the planets. And Kepler-186 is orbiting in this green region, which is uh, the habitable zone. And so the inner four planets orbit um, uh, very close to their stars, so they're far too hot to ever enter the habitable zone. Um, Kepler-186f is um, orbits in a 130-day period, as I mentioned, and so it's um, located in, on the cooler side of the habitable zone. Um, it does orbit within the habitable zone throughout its orbit. So um, here's another schematic of um, the Kepler-186 system compared to the solar system. Um, what's neat about um, this graphic is that you can see um, the entire Kepler-186 system fits just right inside the orbit of Mercury. So it's, um, I think it has a 0.36 AU orbit and Mercury is at 0.38. So it's a scale down um, system. And um, OK, here's another view. Um, this figure shows um, the location of the planets in the habitable, habitable zones of their stars. Um, the uh, horizontal axis shows the distance to each star, and the vertical axis shows the temperature of the star. So the cooler stars are on the bottom. Um, you can see here uh, the habitable zone comes uh, much closer inwards for lower mass stars, and you can see Earth and Kepler-186 um, orbiting um, in, their, in their star's habitable zone. Um, so while these two planets, Earth and Kepler-186, have um, similar properties in terms of the size and their occupancy in the habitable zone, um, we were calling them uh, Earth's cousin. So we, we didn't want to um, uh, claim that this is Earth's twin. It's more like an Earth cousin um, because they have very par different parent stars. Um, they're in very different environments. OK, so um, let's look at what this um, planet might be made of. <clears throat> so Kepler only measures the planet's size. It doesn't measure its planet. Uh, we don't get mass estimates from Kepler photometry. Um, so this is why we stress that this planet is Earth-size and not Earth-like, um, because we can't say with certainty that this planet could be rocky, because we don't have a mass or the composition. Um, there are several reasons why we can argue that this planet is likely rocky, though. Um, First, there's thermal evolution models. Um, these models predict the planets as small as Earth um, are unlikely to be dominated by these thick gas envelopes that you see at the top, or like planets like uh, uh, Neptune um, that don't have a solid surface. Um, uh, secondly, if you take uh, dozens of small planets that we have that have both uh, size estimates and measured masses, um, and you look at the distribution of um, densities for the small population, um, then uh, planets below about 1.5 Earth radii are most likely rocky, and uh, planets above that are um, most likely giant or gaseous planets. Um, so this is really uh, an active area of research right now. And people are trying to determine where is the size cutoff when planets go from rocky to gaseous. And it's somewhere between 1.5 and 1.5 seven Earth radii um, from what we, from the observations that we have right now. Um, Kepler-186f at 1.1, um, the, the smaller you get, the higher probability that it's rocky. Um, so um, given those observations, it's, it's probably rocky. 
Um, third, we don't have anything in our solar system uh, that's larger than Earth. So we have nothing uh, to compare to. We don't have super Earths. The next bigger planet is Neptune, which is um, four times the size of Earth. Um, so we don't know if super Earths um, can be habitable. We don't know their, their properties. Um, what we do know from, um, if you look at all the bodies that are Earth size and smaller in our solar system, they're all composed of iron and rock and ice and water. Um, and so, um, so planets like Kepler 186f, um, although we, we know it's probably not dominated by a, a gas envelope, um, there's still a degeneracy that remains between um, the relative amounts of rock, water, and ice. And so I show here the extremes um, mass measurements that you could have. If this planet were to be um, just one big ice ball, it would be uh, low density and it would have a mass of 0.32 Earth masses at the size. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if it was just made of this iron ball, um, which is not likely, but um, <laughs> Uh, it would have a mass of 3.7 Earth masses. And, um, so it's most likely in the middle of the spectrum containing some uh, um, relative amounts of rock, water, and ice like our Earth. Um, we, we won't know unless we, got, we get a mass measurement. Okay, um, just because <coughs> a planet is in the habitable zone doesn't mean that it's habitable. Um, so M stars are uh, it's notorious for um, presenting uh, new challenges for habitability. I've listed some of them here. Um, because these planets orbit so close to their stars, um, the stellar gravity has a larger effect on them. So um, the, the gravity from the star can induce tides. It can deform um, some planets. And if it deforms them on a um, time-dependent scale, it can cause great internal heating. Um, the, the planets can also become totally locked if they're too close, um, in which the planet rotates once around its axis for every uh, rotation around the star. And this, of course, would, would cause it to have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. Um, so that would be a cause of concern if you're trying to form life on these planets. Um, Kepler-186, um, the inner four planets are close enough that we think they're, they're most likely tidally locked. Um, 186f, however, is at a far enough distance. Um, we don't know its rotation rate, and we don't know the age of the star, which um, could help us uh, constrain rather whether this planet is tidally locked. And so the answer is we don't know if Kepler-186 is tidally locked. Um, um, another concern is high-speed impacts during formation. Um, because you have material closer in, um, with shorter orbital periods, they're going to have fast, higher velocities. And as material accretes, they're going to have um, stronger, more energetic impacts. And if you have an impact that is too high, it can easily um, strip, the, strip an atmosphere and ocean from a planet. Um, it's one of, one of the uh, theories on why Mercury is so metal poor, that maybe there is some giant collision that stripped its atmosphere. And so for planets at these short orbital distances, it's a concern. Um, there's um, a comprehensive reviews. Um, Jill Tarter has a paper from 2007, and there's another paper that have um, a very comprehensive reviews if you want to look at all aspects of, of uh, challenges to habitability for M dwarfs. Okay, so I'd like to move on and address um, these concerns about high speed impacts, um, because I'm interested in planet formation. Um, I'd like to focus on the second half of my talk on how um, these close-in planets like Kepler-186 system could form. Um, but before we look at that, let's look at our own solar system. And, and wh what do we know from our own solar system, given th these decades of modeling? Um, so um, starting, from, uh, <laughs> starting from the bottom, uh, the solar nebula theory is the um, most widely accepted model to explain the formation and evolution of our solar system. Um, so basically, you start with a giant molecular cloud core, and, it, and if it collapses to create a protostar, you're left with a remnant disk of gas and dust. And um, so it is from this um, disk 
where uh, we believe planets accrete and grow from. And so planet formation theory can generally be described in um, three or several distinct um, steps, but, uh, but temporally overlapping steps. And so in your early stage, um, you have growth of dust grains, microscopic dust grains, um, that collide and accrete through some uh, non-gravitational sticking process uh, to grow planetesimals. Um, this is the stage that's least understood. There's still lots of um, people working on that. Um, but we know that planetesimals are there and they had to form somehow. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. Uh, so the middle stages, as bodies collide and accrete, um, once they start picking up mass, the, there's a stage called a runaway growth phase. And that's when the larger bodies start accreting material faster. And so the larger bodies grow faster, and your and you're, end result is you have a bunch of moon to Mars-sized bodies embedded in a, in a disk of tiny, small planetesimals and dust still. So that's generally the middle stage. Um, some people model the middle stages um, because it has different physics and involves gas. When you look at the final stages, um, this is where you assume the gas in the disk has dispersed and it's all just dynamics of, of bodies. Um, so the final stage, um, you look at these bodies in the disk as they continue to interact gravitationally and collisionally um, and you follow uh, their growth until, uh, until the final planets form. And either all the material is secreted or it's uh, tossed into space. And you end up with um, your final planets on stable orbits. <coughs> okay, so um, for the solar system, if you look at the formation time scales and also the composition of the terrestrial planets versus the uh, gas giant planets, um, we, uh, we've come to, to accept that these planets probably formed in situ. And that means they formed sort of in place from local material in the disk. Um, so solar system formation is a bottom-up scenario. Um, all of these planets presumably formed in place with the gas giants forming faster while there's still gas to accrete and then the terrestrial planets forming after. So we have this nice picture of the solar system um, that people for decades um, have developed. And we also have um, some nice uh, numerical models. Um, so uh, um, some of these numerical models are well suited to follow um, the evolution of these final stages. And this is what I've been working on, um, is focusing on the final stages of forming planets. So these n-body algorithms, they track the growth of uh, all the bodies in the disk. Um, we start out the disk with moon to Mars sized bodies, so our initial conditions are meant to encapsulate the middle stage um, of planet formation. So we assume the gas is dispersed and we have this disk. Um, and so, in, in trying to um, do formation simulations uh, to study the solar system, um, what we do is we develop the initial disk and we try to reproduce the solar system planets because we're trying to refine our model adapt it to a solar system. Well, the idea was to develop this model, adapt it to the solar system, and then when other systems come out, you can study them. But that's another story because other systems look nothing like our solar system, so I'll get to that next. Um, but for our solar system, uh, the disk mass is based on this so-called uh, minimum, minimum mass solar nebula. So it's this um, old theory where you uh, imagine taking the mass of all the solar system planets and adding enough light elements so you bring it up to solar composition, you smear the planets out into concentric rings, and then you look at how that mass is distributed as a function of distance to the star. And then from there, you kick off your simulations and then you hope to build your terrestrial planets. And so, um, so this is what uh, we usually do. Um, the two figures at the bottom show an example of one of the initial disks that we start with. On the uh, left side, you see a side view of the disk, and again, that's these moon to Mars sized bodies um, where we uh, use um, several hundred uh, to start out with. Um, in this case, um, this is a simulation for.
or a disk around the sun, so the disk extends from 0.3 to just beyond 4 AU. Um, on the right side, you can see a top-down view um, that's kind of hard to see, sorry, of the same disk. And so the colors represent um, the water mass fraction that, that is in our model. So we assume that bodies that are close to the star are dry, which is shown in red, and bodies further out um, are cooler and, and more water-rich. And so um, in the solar system, uh, the snow line is, is, is uh, defined as the region in the disk um, beyond which ice screens can condense. So in your early disk, where you're, where you're far enough away where you can form some ice screens, and that's what, is what we call the snow line. So in our solar system, that's at 2.7 AU, roughly. Um, so what we do in our simulations is we distribute water out there. Um, <coughs> we uh, follow the evolution forward in time, and then we look at what, um, what planets form and how much water they accrete, and if there's radial mixing of water. Um, and so um, there, there are different um, theories for the origin of Earth's water. I think um, one of the most com commonly accepted ones is that Earth uh, received its water from material that formed in this outer asteroid region. Um, there's other ways you can get it um, through comets, and um, there are some other theories, but I think for the bulk of Earth's water, it predominantly created water that formed from material that formed uh, further out. And so here's an example of one of our simulations for the solar system. You see the initial disk in the top left, and each panel shows a snapshot in time. Um, each panel shows the semi-major axis of each body um, as a function of its eccentricity. So it shows how dynamically excited the disk is. So in this case, um, it took several hundred million years to form uh, planets that are the size of Earth. And, and you can see um, with Jupiter and Saturn here, we are able to form some water-rich Earth-sized planets um, near 1 AU. OK, so now if we want to look at how we can produce um, the Kepler-186 system numerically, um, we're, we're going to attempt to do this same uh, sort of exercise. Um, so we perform the same minimum mass uh, experiment on the system. Um, since we don't know the masses, we assumed that these um, bodies uh, have rocky composition. So to, so, uh, to obtain the surface densities, um, we did the same exercise where we spread the planet's masses in concentric annuli, um, where the boundaries were the mean between the, uh, each of the planet's orbital radii. Um, then you fit a simple power law to, um, this, uh, to these derived surface densities. Um, and so for Kepler-186, the best fit minimum mass disk um, has a very steep profile. Um, the, um, the profile goes as r, where r is the orbital distance, to the minus 2.64 power. So this is very steep. If you compare it to uh, solar system models like the minimum mass solar nebula, the slope is minus 1.5. That's typical. If you look at um, viscous disk models and um, submillimeter mm -hmm. observations of disks, um, they're much flatter. And so this isn't a typical disk, but we're going to move on and try. We're trying to reproduce the solar system. We're not trying to start with what the initial conditions that we should have. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to make these planets. Um, so here's one simulation um, where we try to reproduce these uh, planets numerically. In this case, we started with 40 planetary embryos and 400 planetesimals, um, in this case between 0 0.03 and 0.5 AU, um, so obviously much closer in. So with our derived surface density profile, um, the total mass that we began with is 15 Earth masses. And again, this is a large, this a huge amount of mass. Um, we don't normally see this much mass in disks this close to the star. Um, but um, when we start with this much mass, um, we're able to form planets that are um, roughly similar in mass and orbits to a uh, Kepler-186 system. And here are uh, the final systems um, from a suite um, that we did. Um, 
again we show that um, again we show we can broadly reproduce um, the the masses and orbital architecture of the Kepler 186 planets, which you see in the middle panel. Um, there are several problems, though, with our simulations. Um, one problem is that uh, the planets tend to have um, too high too high mutual inclinations. Um, so we weren't able to reproduce systems that have flat that are flat enough that you would they would be consistent with five planets in transits. The inclinations are much higher. So that's one problem. Um, the second problem is, is obvious here. Um, in all of our simulations, we form too many planets. Um, we always form between one and two planets in between um, Kepler 186e and Kepler 186f. Um, and so could there uh, actually be a planet there is, is one question. And there actually could be a planet that could transit, or that could, there could be a non-transiting planet that we haven't detected. Um, it would only have to have a, a relative inclination of one to two degrees where we wouldn't see it, and it would have to be um, one mass or less um, for, in order for it to not um, perturb Kepler 186f, where we would detect it. So there could be a planet, we don't know. Um, if there's not a planet, then that is sort of a strike against in situ formation because you should form them, or they should be there if these planets formed in situ. Um, so to summarize the formation part, um, we found that a massive disk of material and a very steep surface density profile is needed uh, to form planets um, like Kepler-186 system in situ. Um, as I mentioned, accretion disks with this much mass so close to the star uh, within 0.4 U um, and also these steep surface density profiles aren't commonly observed. Um, and the mutual inclinations are too high, and we form too many planets. Um, so how do we resolve this? Um, we invoke some sort of migration. And migration has been um, controversial um, as far as uh, uh, the modeling our solar system. Um, people have proposed uh, many models of having some planets migrate, and there hasn't been a, a consensus or clear picture of any of these work of these models working. Um, but it is um, a widely studied um, mechanism. Um, and it makes sense to invoke it for these um, systems of planets that don't look like our solar system, that are very close in. How do you form so many uh, close and low mass pl planets in situ when you don't have that much mass there? So it has to be some form of migration. So there's several um, scenarios. You can have um, inward migration of a, of a bunch of material to build up this initial disk before you have in situ. Um, that's one way. You can have planets that form further out and then migrate in later. Or you can have some combination of, of both of these, where you have inward migrating embryos while you're, accre while you're creating and growing bodies and followed by a later phase of of giant impacts. And, and what we need are more disk observations to really constrain what mechanism uh, we should be focusing on. OK, so um, we know uh, Earth-sized planets um, can form around M stars, because we see them now. Um, the uh, question of, could these planets accrete and retain water and volatiles that are needed for life? So there are several early studies um, several years ago that um, came to the conclusion that planets formed around M dwarfs are probably dry. And so Raymond et al. Um, performed a study of these n-body simulations around different sized stars. Um, here um, I've shown his, his results for the solar system and some simulations around the solar mass uh, star. Um, so his study was based on the idea that um, as, you, uh, as you go down to smaller masses, the disk masses should also uh, scale. Um, so this is what some observations tell us, but there's still a lot of scatter. Um, we can't say for sure that that's the case. But um, with those assumptions, this is what he did. 
or as team did. Um, here are some simulations with this disk around a 0.8 solar mass star. And then when you go down to um, a disk around a 0.6 solar mass star, you don't even have enough mass to form bodies that are larger than Mars. And so um, there's a problem. We, if you can't even form Earth-sized planets, then we need, then something's not right with this, or this model isn't right for Kepler-186. Um, and here are his uh, results for 0.4 and a 0.2 solar mass star. Um, so the reasoning in this paper why these planets are dry is because there isn't enough mass to mix up the material and bring that water in from the outside. Um, there's, it's, uh, just, um, it's just a matter of not having enough mass. Uh, Lassauer performed um, some simulations around an M star uh, that are similar to the ones that I described um, earlier that we do. Um, in this case, he, he increased the mass of the disk with the intention of trying to form Earths. And so he pumped up the, the disk mass, um, and this, this is the disk around the star that's one third the times, one third of the solar mass. Um, and so this shows evolution of this disk. Um, the, the symbols at the end, the different colors, just represent the final systems from five different runs. And so, um, and so what you can see here, these planets form on scales of, of millions of years. Um, of course, because they have a smaller uh, orbital radii, the accretion disk, the accretion rate is much faster because you have, everything's closer in. Um, so, so everything forms in, in millions of years. So um, Lassauer's conclusions um, were that these planets are probably dry, and his reasoning is because um, of these high-speed impacts that we mentioned. If you, in this case, um, around this star, the habitable zone is at 0.1 AU. And so at this distance, the, the impacts are so energetic that it would be hard for a planet to retain um, an atmosphere and ocean Okay, so let's talk about Kepler-186 um, and uh, think about what, what is needed to bring in this water. Okay, so I mentioned the snow line for the solar system is at 2.7 AU. Um, if, you can, if you were to scale the snow line um, with stellar mass, um, if you assume the, the snow line <coughs> scales with luminosity, um, then the snow line for Kepler-186f would be at about 0.5 AU. And so um, the problem of determining the snow line is, is more complicated. It depends on, on other factors uh, of the disk and um, different time scales that we don't know. But for simplicity, we'll just say um, it's the snow line's at 0.5 AU from Kepler-186f. OK, so knowing that Kepler-186 um, F orbits at 0.36 AU, and knowing that you need uh, a massive disk to create these planets, um, you can imagine that even if you have a massive disk that was there somehow in, in, in not even thinking of migration, there is enough mass in that disk to, to um, promote radial mixing among the bodies in the disk. And since Kepler-186 is um, on the cooler edge of the habitable zone, it's much closer to the snow line. So it wouldn't take very much radial mixing for, for these water-rich bodies to, to uh, accrete in this region where Kepler-186 is forming. And then if you think about whether um, there's migration in the picture, then that makes it so much easier. If you have any material coming in, it doesn't have to go that far uh, to create water-rich bodies. And so it's, it's pretty simple to imagine um, that Kepler-186f could have accreted water. <coughs> And furthermore, um, very little water is needed. And so if you look at this picture, this is Earth. And although <coughs> Earth is covered, um, you know, 70% of the surface is covered in water, <coughs> if you were to take all that water and squeeze it into a small ball, it would look like this. And that ball would be about half the um, size of the moon. So and relatively speaking, you don't need that much water uh, to have a, a planet with 
uh, I have a wolf on it, I guess. Um, but retainment is still a concern. Um, the Kepler 186F is a little further out than the um, systems that Lassar showed. Um, so what we're doing now is um, we're taking our n-body uh, algorithms and we're incorporating a um, state-of-the-art collision code um, into it. And this is currently in progress. Um, there's a nice um, collision theory uh, that we're incorporating that takes into account um, uh, realistic collisions and fragmentation. Um, it follows um, all types of collision scenarios. If bodies hit and they exchange some mass and but keep their same um, bodies, these are called hit and run events, um, it tracks those. It tracks uh, complete uh, destruction and um, it's, it's really neat, I'm excited about it. Um, and you can also give it uh, minimum uh, fragmentation mass so you can keep these end body uh, simulations tractable. Um, because when you, uh, these end body simulations are notorious for taking a very long time. They can take weeks to months, um, even on a supercomputer. And so to keep things tractable, um, well, when you have n bodies, uh, um, the time to simulate them goes as n squared. So if you keep adding small fragments, at some point you need to, uh, you need to control, <laughs> the, control the problem. So we're working on trying to, um, trying, we're working on trying to find the right uh, uh, resolution. We want to go to the smallest resolution. So we want to look at these tiny impacts um, and see if these planets can form, um, like where Kepler 186F is, and retain some water. Um, maybe there's, maybe a lot of water gets knocked off early on and then uh, it still picks them up later on. Um, that probably happens, but how often does it happen? And how small does a star have to be in order to um, retain some of this water? And so that's what we're working on right now. And so um, it's exciting, um, stay tuned for that. Okay, so to summarize, um, Kepler-186f is a 1.1 plus or minus 0.1 Earth-sized planet. Um, it's one of five planets, um, all roughly Earth-sized, that transit an early M dwarf. It receives about a third of the energy that Earth receives from the Sun, placing it in the uh, outer edge of the stellar habitable zone. So um, we know the planet has the right size and orbit to potentially support liquid water given an appropriate atmosphere. Um, but I should stress that we don't know its mass, we don't know its composition, we don't know its rotation rate or axial tilt, or whether it even has an atmosphere. Um, so all of these are crucial to determining habitability. Um, so, so, so I just want to stress that um, just being in the habitable zone doesn't make it habitable. We're, this is the first step. Um, Kepler-186 is more like a proof of concept. These planets that are this small exist in a habitable zone. So now we've shown that. So the next step um, will probably happen with the next missions that are coming up, like TESS and JWST. Um, Kepler-186 is, uh, is too far, 500 light years, for us to do any follow-up on it. Um, but we can start now and start characterizing these planets and looking into their habitability so when TESS mission finds these planets, um, uh, we'll have some, we'll know uh, what, what to look for next. Um, JWST <coughs> has the potential to take the M dwarfs that TESS might find and actually probe their atmospheres, looking for biomarkers. And so if all this works out, this is still in our lifetime. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I think this is, M dwarfs have been a hot topic. I think they're going to um, continue to be a hot topic. And, so I hope more people work on all of these issues on habitability. I think they're important. Um, for formation, Kepler-186 uh, planets can only form in situ with a high disk mass, which isn't commonly observed. Uh, the most likely formation scenario is um, that these bodies accreted um, embryos while they are migrating, um, followed by a late stage of giant impact. And as I mentioned, it's easy to explain how they can accrete water. Um, we're currently working on studying the retainment of water. 
um, with these new uh, algorithms. And lastly, um, I think it's important to um, uh, probe the disk masses observationally. I think that's critical to constraining these formation mechanisms so we can focus on, on, focus on those. And, oh, I just put this up, um, just uh, placing Kepler-186F into context. So if you imagine, um, this shows the patch of sky that Kepler um, monitored. In the grand scheme of things, it's small. In that small patch, we've discovered hundreds of planets, thousands of candidates. Um, so in the given, in, in this Milky Way galaxy, we have hundreds of billions of stars. And so you can imagine if we were able to even find one Earth planet in the small patch of sky that, and the fact that M dwarfs um, occupy at least 70% of all stars, so most of the stars are M dwarfs, um, the chances of having more habitable planets, um, it seems hard to imagine that they're not out there. So, um, also, there's hundreds of billions of these galaxies in the universe, so there's lots of stars. <laughs> there's got to be lots of habitable planets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let us look more. And uh, to end, um, uh, SETI has been monitoring Kepler 186F um, since 2012, and that's because the inner planets were detected early on, and so, um, so we're listening for that. Thank you. If you have a question, just um, raise your hand and I'll get around to you. Elisa, uh, so do we have any other examples of, of, uh, of the Kepler 186 system in other Kepler systems of you know, five terrestrial planets and close to an M, M star? Uh, or is this the only one? Uh, you mean Earth sized planets? And the well, of, of, of so many planets, so many terrestrial, so many Earth sized planets. Um, in close to a cool star. Um, yeah, so, the, so if you look at all of the planets Kepler has discovered, um, the most dominant are these systems of small close-in planets um, uh, by far. We're not, you know, we're not seeing Jupiters. Jupiters are, are looking to be scarce. We're finding um, lots of these small systems. Um, around cool stars, there are some, I don't know how many, Jason probably knows. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we definitely have some candidates that we're looking at. Okay, so there are, uh, I guess what I was get, getting at was, um, so is, is it common for a large mass of terrestrial planets to be around M stars like, like um, Kepler 186? It's from what we can tell. We can yeah, tell. it seems M stars seem to be able to form uh, small rocky bodies quite often. Mm -hmm. I think that's and Is it possible in the, safe to say. that in the gap between Kepler 186 B and F, there's an asteroid belt. Do we have any ways of getting at that mass? Uh, no, I think it's, yeah, it's quite possible. Um, I don't, no, I don't think we would be able to, no. to detect it. Hi, Lisa. Um, with these new collision models that you're using, are you able to consider a lot more mass in the beginning and track the mass loss? The, the planets that we're losing. I mean, that seems to be, there's a suggestion that that's, that's what's happening a lot, and yet I don't see the disk models actually giving us a handle on that. Um, sure, we can, um, do you mean increase the disk mass, or? Thank you, sorry, sorry. Early on, it's higher, but you've lost many of the planets. Oh yeah, we can track. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, we can follow the evolution of anything, anything we start out with. That's a good idea. Hi, Alyssa. Um, you mentioned in your summary what we don't know a few things. Um, one thing that jumped out at me was the axial tilt. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where my question is going, if you allow me just to. Um, our moon, of course, is what keeps the Earth on its axis. The axis, of course, is what uh, contributes to a stable climate, if you will. Mm -hmm. And the stable climate, I think, is a key factor in the evolution of life and habitability. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, are you or are, are, are there scientists out there that are looking for satellites like our moon um, 
near these exoplanets that, that may be contributing factors to habitability or evolution? Um, there, there is the uh, survey um, underway with Kepler data to look for um, exomoons. I think uh, we haven't found any yet, um, or other people haven't found any yet. Um, as far as finding some and finding information about the tilt, um, I guess it's possible. Um, we just haven't. I, it's very difficult, but that's not to say impo it's not impossible. So yeah, that, th if we found some moons, then that'd certainly be interesting to look at that aspect if it helps or hinders habitability. Uh, <coughs> Alisa, uh, what do the theorists say about the uh, the solar wind radiation emitting, emanating from M stars and the impact that it has on 0.2, 0 0.4 AU? Um, so. So, I, so these M stars, when they're young, they're very highly active. Um, they, they produce giant flares, which can scorch a planet. Um, I'm not really an expert on that um, as far as um, how these planets can survive that early stage. Um, it could be that these planets form and the, every, all their atmosphere is stripped because of all this. And, but if they survive that early stage, maybe they'll have a second wind and uh, and create you know another atmosphere that could be one way, but I don't know what the other uh, uh, any other ideas. I haven't really looked into it. I've got a question right here about actually two questions about the water. First of all, in your models, when you insert water, a is that an arbitrary action, and is not the snow line, the, uh, the frost line, the snow line, actually a function of how much water you put in there. So there is an arbitrary, is there an arbitrary element to all of this? Um, so the current models, I think um, the only thing we can do is look at geochemical data. And so we look at uh, the abundance of asteroids um, beyond 2AU um, compared to the, uh, um, so uh, there's this uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio is a good marker for determining uh, water content of different bodies. So if you could measure the stage ratio of the ocean and, see, and then you take these measurements from all different um, asteroids and meteor, uh, meteorites that you find, um, you can kind of trace um, uh, a, a distribution of water. Um, so the carbonaceous chondrites around 2AU um, ha are moderately wet and beyond that, you know, they're they're much wetter. So what we usually do is we have a step profile where it's very dry out to 2 AU. Between 2 and 2.5 AU, it's uh, maybe uh, half a percent water and then 5 percent water beyond there. And it's very crude. Percent as? Uh, the water mass fraction in the for, the, for the bodies in the disk. So we, the so we, what about the uh, OK, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it's a very, very crude model, and that's uh, this, the simplest model we can do is just this step function based on what we know from meteorites. Um, we tried to do, some people are trying to do more uh, sophisticated ones, but I, yeah, I think it's... Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, the snow line uh, confuses me a little. Uh, I'm surprised it, for the solar system, it's out at 2.7 AU, since the Earth, if it didn't have the greenhouse effect, wouldn't it be a frozen planet? Um, I guess this is determined from um, an earlier stage on the primordial disk. It was at this, it was this region where ice could condense. Um, uh, well, I think the earlier sun was dimmer than it is today, uh, so I'm confused. Um, we'll talk after. <laughs> I have a, a question about tidal locking. Would you like our moon and, and Charon around Pluto are tidally locked? Mercury is tidally synchronous, but not locked, I guess, uh, three to two. Now, do we have any models that would predict the, the probability that the 186F just inside the orbit of Mercury, but with a smaller mass star, would probabilities of it being tightly synchronous or tightly locked? 
Yeah, we did. Um, well, someone on, on our team who studies tides um, looked at the system um, with, with some tidal theory. And what she found was the inner four planets um, were suit, were went to pseudo-synchronous rotation on the order of millions of years. Mm. Um, for Kepler-186 at that distance, um, it did tidally circularize, but on the um, order of billions of years. And so the problem is we don't know the age of the star. So the, mm. um, since these um, stars are so, so long lived, it's, pro it's probably really old, um, mm -hmm. but we can't say for sure. Um, we think it's the stars may be several billion years old, um, uh, but we're not certain. So, if, so if we had that, then we would know um, whether it was whether the uh, it was uh, tidally, tidally synchronous. So, 186 F may or may not be tidally locked or or in syn rotational synchronization with the, its star. It probably is, but we can't say for sure. Uh. <laughs> Okay, if you have any more questions for Elisa, I encourage you to come up and chat to her after this. Elisa, we have a, a special set of uh, talks you. mug. It's got a couple of robots there. They're potential inhabitants of Kepler-186F, <laughs> perhaps. Okay. Please, please join me in thanking Elisa for a great talk.